right. <clears throat> Am I going to talk to the camera and see what we get? Or you can just talk to me. All righty. So here's where it all starts. This is biochar as it was made from wood. And this indigo color is one of the things that the aestheticists strive for. The other thing we strive for is an amazingly friable material that just breaks up when it's finally in the soil. Now that's dirty, but that's not greasy. So, in fact, that silver color is another thing we look for. So, this is too big to go in the soil. So we use machinery or time to break it down. In a climate that has freeze-thaw, this would fill up with water in the fall, freeze and shatter in the soil. So you'd come back. So Mother Nature will do it in time. But we have a couple of examples of typical biochar formulations. This drum over here is biochar that's been made from wood chips. So this was the highway department going along, clearing limbs, putting it into that chipper, and then we just put that in the pyrolyzer and converted it. It's, again, the nice silvery color. There's occasional bits of what's called torrified wood. It's going to be just a little more composted carbon. Depending on the use, you may or may not want to chop this down. Ultimately biochar is going to want to be a millimeter or less and that's so it can pass through an earthworm's gut. That is really the key to completing Mother Nature's cycle in the soil is to incorporate in the micro and macro biology in the soil. So the microbes are amoebas and fungi and a myriad, the soil web, food web, and macro uh, life is uh, everything from earthworms to moles to all sorts of things. So we've got them all. So in this case, there's some actual material here that was actually made, probably some from, I can see some wood pellets were in there and turned into char. So one of the things we quite often do is take a char like this, if we're going to use it in the soil right away, and get some hardware cloth, the quarter inch, the, the heavy screen, not the fine screen like you have on your windows, and then just make a rack and shovel it on there. Whatever goes through, now you use that, and the other stuff you just chop up a little bit with a mm -hmm. pail. Or you can always run it through a hammer mill or a chipper or any other device to kind of chew it back down. But what's going to end up happening? This is like compost. You're going to start with banana peels, they're not the right form, and you're going to learn how, via the transformations, to get it to the place you want for the soil to then take the benefit. There is no hard and fast formula, but there's a whole lot of common sense, and okay. let's keep doing, let's keep common sense in the, the equation. The impression I've gotten from some of the videotapes on YouTube is you put it in the garden and it's ready to go. So. There's some work to be done to convert this into something that's really ready to go. All right, two, two observations. That story about Jack and the Beanstalk, that wasn't actually a true story. There was some liberties taken in how that was told. So people that imagine biochar as like Jack and the Beanstalk's experience are in fact stretching things excessively. I tell people raw biochar, this material as it's made, has now been transformed into the stable carbon that will be here for thousands of years. That's a very important property. Now we can modify the soil permanently for a thousand years and make an improvement. However, I also tell people it's a bit like ground beef. You know, ground beef, raw ground beef, is it food? Well, yes, it can be made into very healthy meals. However, Having been a scoutmaster, I'll tell you, do not eat raw ground beef because bad things happen. You need to transform it into the form that the soil is ready to accept or the, that the plant can benefit from. And so in that capacity, I tend to, to, to define transformations in three basic directions. 
and this is just to keep track of them in my own head. They're called conditioning, charging, and inoculating, CCI. Conditioning is the equilibration of this material, which is bone dry and has some soluble salts in it, and sometimes some biochars have a little bit of sugar and some tars in them that dissolve in the water. It's equilibrating it with the groundwater in the soil. So a couple of rinses is what conditions the biochar. It gets it at the moisture equilibrium of the soil and in the soil's hydraulic cycle. So that would happen partly when it rains and partly if there's moisture in the soil already. Yes, but think like Mother Nature where she's going through a whole season where there may be flooding, there may be melt-offs in the spring. So as a rule, conditioning is going to involve actually saturating the biochar and draining some of that to get some salts to leave. Because a lot of these salts that come in, and they're not a lot in clean wood, but depending on the char source, there may be more salt in it and more, uh, uh, well, called TDS or salt. Um, Again, we, what we need to do is prevent this from stealing water from the plant by making sure there's enough. So that's conditioning. Charging is the fact that this is a battery, but it's initially a battery that has no charge. So when I first put it into the soil, it is going to charge itself up with nutrients, which it's going to hold and make available to the plant later in the growing season. So I need to make sure that I either pre-charge it or when I put it in the soil, I provide an excess beyond what I would normally provide in the soil of nutrients, of plant nutrients, whether it's compost or some other source of NPK, to allow this to charge up at the same time that the plant is being fed. The last one is called inoculating, which is making it compatible with microbial life. And microbial, it's not any particular microbial life. I'm not actually of the school of the, uh, you know, uh, uh, mushroom uh, tea or compost tea, the magic, you know, I'm going to put these mycorrhizal bugs in there and magic things are going to happen. I think the bugs that you put on biochar serve an important purpose of taking a lot of the available carbon, the sugars, and converting them into higher either living forms or had been living forms that provide part of that soil food web. So they're no longer soluble in water, so they're less likely to wash away. They're now bound up in a hierarchy of living tissues. Having said that, once you put them in the soil, it's typical that the soil's microbes will then dominate, because there's something about your soil and those microbes that they like each other. So, it's good to have microbial activity. I just draw the line at people saying, you know, you need my superbug in your garden because only after I cash your check will my superbug make your garden fantastic. Again, we're back to Jack and the Beanstalk type st stories. So, conditioning, charging, inoculating. A lot of work. Composting does all three of these by itself. So if you take this material and put it at the front end of your composting process and pass it through your composting process, in the course of composting you'll have that exchange of water to get the excess salts out. You'll have the nutrients thrown off by the compost that this will charge up with. And you'll have the microbial compost activity that will create this hierarchy of foods for other m microbes. So you get it all done at once. That's How, great. Yeah, it's absolutely, that's what Mother Nature does. When the leaf falls here, she doesn't say, all right, I'm going to work real hard. No, she just waits a while and lets it all degrade. The only problem, your composting won't smell. And this is problematic for people that use their nose to decide when the compost is done. So they put the biochar in, they put the compost in, and they come out the next day and it's done. That's not how it works. This soaked up all that odor. So that's a good thing. It's taken up those nutrients. It will make the composting go faster. 
but go back to touching the compost and making sure it's done from your tactile inputs also because right. your nose is never going to compete with this barrel of charcoal which sucks up all the moisture all, right. uh, so all the all the odors I think in terms of a year or more for the composting to go through its complete cycle say again I think in terms of a year or more for a compost to go through its cycle well the actual composting cycle can be as slow as a year and that's a typical seasonal compost where there's absolutely no manipulation to as fast as three weeks if you're actively composting and turning and aerating and you know sort of and that comes down to sort of industrial composting where you've got grass clippings coming in every week and you gotta move it through and it's a land sort of thing or you have a meticulously maintained backyard like this one right here which we let every natural process including trees falling from the sky occur and almost a, a, a conscious benign negligence is about as close as I can come to <laughs> claiming that. So this was made from chips. It's raw biochar. We've really got to do some things to it before a plant can interact with that. Here's another char. And this char has been ground up and then sieved out. And this is actually called coarse powder. We have a fine powder which is almost like talcum powder. Now this is really all set to go. The only concern here is it's bone dry, it still hasn't been conditioned or charged or inoculated, and it's very dusty. So if we put it down, we want to wet it just to make it stick, and we want to maybe work it into the topsoil to uh, get it so it doesn't blow away, but we also don't want to put it right down in the root zone right away because we want to have it have a chance to charge up and inoculate and become sort of that. And the microbes will go to the char. You don't have to bring biochar to the root zones at the bottom. They'll send those hypha and all the other uh, retrieval mechanisms up to get that. Um, so this is a little bit more good to go than what it is. It's really a different preparation because if I was going into a potting mix and I was doing seed starts, I would probably take my standard potting mix and put in five or ten volume percent of this material, wet it up. Potting mixtures have lots of new excess fertilizer in them because we want the plant to say, hey, it's a good time to start. The seed goes in and it's a great start. And that's, that's actually what this is. This is some potting mix that's been made by composting the biochar. And you can see the pieces of biochar were big and they, you know, they got, they'll grind down over time. Mixed with, this is entirely a synthetic compost blend. This is made out of horse manure, um, a lot of leaves, a lot of uh, yard trimmings. My colleague up in, in, in uh, New Hampshire makes this stuff for use up there. And again, he's taken, this is in topsoil, this is a rock. So, yeah, you don't need those. those. We make lots of those in New Hampshire also. But, again, this is the kind of thing that you're going to do. And the char is only 5 to 10 volume percent of it. So, from a composting strategy, a good approach is to take, at the front end of the compost, take three parts green compost by volume, one part biochar, maybe ground up a bit, blend it all together, start that in. The composting portion is going to shrink down to about a third of its original volume as it composts. Now exiting that I'll have a 50-50 compost biochar blend and now this can go in as a top dressing or as a potting mix or as a useful way. I, my goal is ultimately to have 5 to 10 volume percent in my soil root zone at the end of the day or the century or whatever duration you're thinking in. Yeah, that's about the same number that I've gotten from other sources too. Yeah, uh, for, for to permanently modify the whole soil you need 5 to 10 volume percent. If you have a soil that has a toxicity, so it had some old pesticides in it or it had some problems because it had some contamination, as little as 1% of the pure biochar will detoxify because it's just soaking up the trace amount of chemicals. 
but it doesn't transform the soil. You know, and planters, you know, growers have such a great feel for soil. They just, when you bring a, a grower out to a, to a, a plot, they, they, they reach down and grab the soil, and you don't even have to talk, because the soil's talking to them. And that's what I want you to do. Take all those instincts you have about good soil and use biochar as a transforming mechanism, a tool in your toolbox to help you make more effective soil. And play with it. Have and, fun. And when you say green material, three parts green and one part biochar, uh, what is the green material? Well, it's compost? whatever you would have started your compost with. So some people start their compost with a mixture of leaves and manure and straw and you know other amendments. Some people start it with cardboard and the newspapers and banana peels. Uh, you know, there's probably some advocate out there that starts his compost with cigar butts and decides <laughs> this is the absolute best way to make the best compost. However you were going to do it before, just add this in as a quarter of the volume. Okay, so so it even, transfers through and gets the benefit of being composted also. You can even include meat scraps then. Whatever you put into the front end of your compost that you've successfully been taking out the back end and using, stick with it. So this is just going to make the composting a little more effective because the microbes are going to benefit from the biochar's presence. It's going to charge the biochar with the nutrients that the compost quite often throws off, principally nitrogen, ammonia, and nitrates, and phosphorus and potassium. And it's going to get your conditioning out of the way. So it's, uh, it's either Mother Nature or a lazy man's way of doing it. And I'm not so sure there has to be a difference a lot of the time. So the last version I wanted to show you is a material made in a device called an atom retort. And then it was made actually from very large pieces of wood. And then we took it out through a um, kind of a chipper and crushed it up. So it made everything from a powder to some fairly small pieces. And it's pretty much good to go. It's all going to break down from there. And again, it's very dusty when it's first made, so we need to be wetting it and CCIing it. You know, it's all part of it before the plant benefits. But uh, it's all just a material you can work with. And um, you know, at this point in the biochar world, what I look for is what was it made from? Because I want my biochars made from clean woody residues or clean agricultural residues. I don't want construction debris, sheet rock, pressure treated lumber or anything else that could have. There's so much uncontaminated waste biomass. So we look out here. Right here. All of this stuff. Yeah, start say. with this. That's what I want the biochar world to do is to show up and deal with this first. Yep. No, there's just a tremendous amount of it so we don't need to be you know, there are other scenarios. We look at uh, cardboard's a very excellent material because in urban settings, cardboard's being brought in and then discarded. How and about, it doesn't have a, a natural outlet for recycling in most settings. How about skids? Again, you just need to look and decide if there's going to be any chemicals introduced at some point. Yeah. If they're painting them or if they're pressure treating them to prevent rotting and stuff, that's going to introduce some things. The char will take a lot of that out, but the char is a natural amendment. It's not a cure-all. You can't undo all of the sort of potential pitfalls that, that the humans might... Uh, and if you have the char taking out uh, really bad stuff, it's still in the garden, so... It is, although it tends to sequester it at below a toxicity level, and actually the microbes will chew it up over time. So it actually makes it bio-unavailable to the plant and bio-unavailable... To the, to the people, but the microbes actually will chew them up assuming it's an organic, a, a pesticide, or an explosive, or some other thing that can be degraded. Now if it's heavy metals, if it's cadmium or lead or whatever, it's not going anywhere because it can't, you know, this is not a nuclear transformation. It does, however, tend to bind it up by creating a lot of life to compete for it. See, that's our dustiness that's we keep fighting. So I need to, let's, let's pick a pause. I need to make that.